Welcome to Indianapolis, Indiana, USA, and the 28th General Assembly and Conventions. Bienvenidos a Indianapolis, Indiana, Estados Unidos, y a la vigésimo octava Asamblea General y Convenciones. We're happy to be back. Estamos contentos de estar aquí otra vez. In a city of diversity, action, and houses of worship. En una ciudad llena de diversidad, acción y templos. Our theme is to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. Nuestro lema es para que haya discípulos de Cristo en todas las naciones. Underlying this theme are our three core values. Sustentando a este lema están nuestros tres valores fundamentales. We are Christian. Somos cristianos. We are holiness. Somos sagrados. We are missional. Somos misionales. This morning, our focus is the promise of Pentecost. Esta mañana hablaremos de la promesa de Pentecostés. Together, we await God's presence in worship, proclamation, and sacrament. Juntos, esperamos la presencia de Dios en la adoración, la proclamación y el sacramento. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and on behalf of the Board of General Superintendents, it is my privilege to open the 28th General Assembly, Church of the Nazarene. We welcome all of you at this time, and to those who are joining us through the internet, we remind you that it is in the history of the Church of the Nazarene that we start the General Assembly with uh, worship. Uh, it is significant that the first of the seven priorities that the Board of General Superintendents share with you this these days is meaningful worship. Our business meeting meetings will start on Monday, but today is the special day. Like the psalmist, let us all acknowledge the presence of the Lord with us. I declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Exaltai ao Senhor nosso Deus, e prostrai-vos ante o seu santo monte, porque santo é o Senhor nosso Deus. Exaltai ao Senhor nuestro Deus, e adorá ao monte de sua santidade, Porque el Señor nuestro Dios es santo. Exalté el Eternal notre Dieu, y prosternez-vous sur la montagne sainte, car il es saint, el Eternal notre Dieu. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord. We need your presence on the long road, the road between fear and hope. The road between the place where all is lost and the place of resurrection. Like the disciples walking the road to Emmaus, we are in the need of your company. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. 
let this time of worship be a special time. Amen. We want our worship to be a sweet offering this morning to our Lord. We hail him as our King, our King Jesus. And this morning, Father, we humble ourselves to your leadership over our lives. We open ourselves to your leadership and acknowledge that you alone rule in loving kindness over all that is. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Would you join me in reading responsively this morning? Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. May the praise of God be in their mouths. May the nations be glad and sing the Lord. For you rule the nations justly and guide the nations of the earth. Jesus shall reign. He is reigning even today. This is a beautiful day. Let's pray to the Lord this morning. Vamos a orar al Señor en esta mañana. Let's say to the Lord, thanks. Vamos a darle gracias al Señor because he is good with us. Señor, en esta mañana, te adoramos, te bendecimos, te alabamos porque eres grande, maravilloso, misericordioso con cada uno de nosotros. Exaltamos tu nombre, Señor. Eres justo, Nos permites estar aquí en esta mañana. Eres bueno. Permites que cada uno de nosotros podamos ver tus bondades. En el nombre de Jesús. Te pedimos que tú bendigas a este grupo de hombres y mujeres que han venido de todo el mundo para adorarte, para bendecirte, para exaltarte. Y te suplicamos en el nombre de Jesús que tú les prosperes en todo lo que hagan. Que cada una de las cosas que ellos realicen, Señor, sean para tu honra y tu gloria bendice también al predicador en el nombre de Cristo Jesús Amen Would you join me to read the Lord prayer this morning I think that we have in five languages on the screen I will read in Spanish you will read in your own language Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos santificado sea tu nombre venga tu reino hágase tu voluntad como en el cielo así también en la tierra el pan nuestro de cada día danos hoy perdónanos nuestras deudas como también nosotros perdonamos a nuestros deudores no nos metas en tentación sino líbranos del mal porque tuyo es el reino El poder y la gloria por todos los siglos. Amén. Welcome to Mesoamerica, a region with a diversity of cultures. Please join me to discover one of the most beautiful places of the world. Our Mesoamerica region is composed of the southern half of Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean islands with a great diversity of cultures, a total of 31 countries, which are divided in six fields. Northern Mexico, field office in Guadalajara. With very hospitable people, beautiful costumes as a Ketchkamil and the Charo, Guadalajara provides a wide variety of dishes characteristic from the region, such as the iconic drought cake. The Santiago River and Oblitz Canyon are some of the most beautiful landscapes to visit in Guadalajara, while the temperature ranges between 33 and minus 6 degrees Celsius. A beautiful field where we are more than 16,000 Nazarenes who love the Lord. Southern Mexico Field Office in Mexico City The people in Mexico City are very friendly with their customary dresses such as blouses, skirts, shawls, embroidery, and aprons. The traditional local cuisine is represented by the Acapulco ceviche dish. Southern Mexico has the most beautiful beaches in the region, 
represented by the Acapulco and Palenque as part of the beautiful scenery. The temperature ranges between 39 and 16 degrees Celsius. We are over 43,000 Nazarenes in Mexico. You're welcome to see what God is doing here. CA4 Field Office in Guatemala City, Republic of Guatemala. The people in Guatemala City are quiet and friendly, while wearing their colorful costumes as the huipil and the sute. A wide variety of typical dishes include the chuchitos, among many others. Its most important landscapes include the volcanic change in lava flows, while the local temperature ranges between 27 and 5 degrees Celsius. With over 111,000 members of our Church of the Nazarene, growing every day to reach more souls for Christ. Central Meso Field Office in San Jose, Costa Rica. Its people are very affectionate with the culture and rich and beautiful costumes. Many celebrities have enjoyed its delicious local cuisine. Such culinary exquisite dishes, like the gallo pinto, among many other delicacies. The area is surrounded by beautiful mountains with its volcanoes and pristine beaches. The local temperature ranges between 31 and 10 degrees Celsius. Here we are more than 32,000 Nazarenes waiting for you to visit. French Field Field Office in Port-au-Prince, the Republic of Haiti. The people in Haiti are hardworking and industrious. The local culinary highlights include the typical dishes such as beef ragu, meat with vegetables, fried pork, and fish with spicy sauce. The beaches and mountains decorate their beautiful landscapes while you can enjoy its tropical climate on the coast and cold up in the mountains. With the highest membership in the region, reaching over 119,000 active Nazarenes, we thrive every day to share the message of love of Jesus Christ and reach the whole country. English Field Field Office in Georgetown, Guyana The friendly locals here wear their typical beautiful costumes with a variety of typical dishes and stunning landscapes. Such a fantastic place with over 25,000 Nazarenes serving the Lord and growing spiritually every day. We would like to thank our God for making possible this transition and allowing us to grow in membership during the year 2011 to over 344,000 Nazarenes and in the year 2012 to over 348,000 more members. Currently, we have more than 2,792 organized churches and another 238 in the process. Thank you for joining me on this journey. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Across the church, we've been praying for the last few weeks for Maria Teresa Duarte, wife of General Superintendent. Dr. Eugenio Duarte, I'm pleased to tell you today that Maria Teresa has joined us for the morning worship service. We welcome you, Maria Teresa, and we give thanks to God 
for answering prayer, and we continue to pray for your rehabilitation and your recovery. Nazarenes around the world love you and will lift you in prayer. Thank you for making the effort to be here today. We celebrate your presence this morning. Our offering goal for the General Assembly is $300,000. 10% of each offering goes to Nazarene Compassionate Ministry Projects. If you're watching this service via web streaming, and we welcome all of you who are doing so, you can go online to www.nazarene.org give, and you may give electronically. And we sincerely hope that you will do so. In the building today, you can give checks. Uh, you can give cash. You can put an IOU, an I promise. You can even put in, I wish I could. But we do want everybody to put something in the plate. The members of the Board of General Superintendents have invited many of our district superintendents to join us in giving at least $500 to support this General Assembly. Our board has committed $1,000 apiece for this General Assembly effort. And I reached into my pocket this morning and I got out another $120 that I'll be putting in the plate today, $10 for every member of my family that is present today. If we could have everybody here join us in giving at least $10 and many could do more we could raise an offering of $200,000 this morning, which would be the largest single offering in the history of a General Assembly in the Church of the Nazarene. Do you believe we can do that? Well, some of you do, and I appreciate that. We can do it, everybody participating. If you can't give $10, give something. Everybody joining together. I heard uh, the story of Father O'Malley seated in his office. The phone rang, and he said, Father O'Malley here. And the party on the other line said, this is the internal revenue. We'd like to know if you know Dan O'Grady. Well, he said, yes, I do. He said, is he a member of your parish? He said, I believe he is. He said, did he donate $10,000 to your parish this year? He said, he will. <laughs> Let's not wait until Father O'Malley calls. Let's all join together. Ushers, if you would take your places at this time, we'll have a word of prayer and we will receive an offering today from our wonderful and generous People. Generosity is not something we do. Generous is who we are. Bless now our giving, Father, and all that will take place in this service. Be glorified in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Jess Middendorf was chosen as general superintendent in the Church of the Nazarene at the 25th General Assembly held here in Indianapolis, Indiana, USA, in June of 2001. He had served for the previous 10 years as pastor of the First Church of the Nazarene in Kansas City, Missouri. Jess Middendorf is the epitome of a Southern gentleman, born in Nashville, Tennessee, USA, began preaching at the age of 16 a graduate of Trevecca Nazarene University, Nazarene Theological Seminary, with both an MDiv and a DMIN, and having received an honorary Doctorate of Divinity from Southern Nazarene University. Jess Mendorf is not only a scholar, he's a follower of Christ, he's a wonderful husband, a devoted father, Beloved grandfather, he is a friend to those of us who serve with him on the Board of General Superintendents and to everyone in the church. He has become an individual who has 
Dr. Porter helped to answer one of the questions, who is discipling me? And one of the men who has discipled me over these past eight years has been Jess Middendorf. He's going to bring the word to us following the reading of the scripture, and I'm anxious to receive what God has given him to give to us. Preaching text today is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. Would you stand for the reading of God's word? In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. These are among the opening words of the history book of the early New Testament church. This is the foundational understanding of what Jesus came to earth to accomplish in the incarnation. This is the restoration of the kingdom of God, first promised in its initial expression in Genesis 3.15. This is the fulfillment of what God intended when he created Adam. This is the mission for which he called Abraham. This is the promise of the deliverance of humanity from the dominion and power of sin, a deliverance made possible through the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The law, written on tablets of stone given to us through Moses, may now be written on our hearts. This is the declaration of Jesus to his disciples. The kingdom of God has come. This is how the work of the Holy Spirit is to be understood in his sanctifying activity in the life of the church and in the life of the believer. The purpose of the work of the Spirit in your life and in mine, in your church and in mine, is to transform all of us into living, breathing representations that the kingdom of God has come. Jesus is the king. He is the sovereign Lord. All other sovereignties on this earth are but a poor imitation of his ultimate sovereignty. The kingdom of God has come to Indianapolis, to Delhi, to Nairobi, to Seoul, to Buenos Aires, to Istanbul, to Jerusalem, to Baghdad, to Beijing, 
to Addis Ababa, to Amman. Oh, I might let you know I had a few moments last evening with Linda and Kay Browning, missionaries in the Middle East. And they reminded me that today, today, Sunday, June the 23rd, in the Eastern Christian calendar is Pentecost Sunday. Our churches in the Middle East observe that calendar. And today, today, while we are here in Amman, Jordan, Nazarene leaders are gathering together at 6 p.m. Saturday in Amman. That is 11 a.m. in Indianapolis. They are going to expect three thousand people to gather for a time of the celebration of Pentecost. They are also having this special worship time as a time of prayer for God to pour out His Spirit on the church and their country. They're especially pleading and we join them in prayer that God will bless their gathering and spread his power and his presence throughout the troubled Middle East. You see, we have an announcement to make. The kingdom of God has come. In Amman, Jordan, the kingdom of God has come. This is what we mean in the Church of the Nazarene when we talk about making Christ-like disciples in the nations. We have an announcement to make. The kingdom of God has come and you and I have been raised up to invite everyone everywhere to join this kingdom and we invite them to Christ likeness this is inner moral transformation made possible by the infilling with the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer and in the community of faith we call the church This is what Jesus intended his disciples to understand when he made these incredible promises to them. You will be my witnesses. I've heard some predictions of doom and pessimism regarding the church that are often expressed as a kind of wisdom, sometimes expressed in hushed and somber tones. But today I want to say to you from the bottom of my heart, I've read the promises. I've read the story. Jesus Christ is king. The kingdom of God has come. Oh, we all long and pray for a fresh outpouring of the spirit on our church and in our lives. And what Satan does indeed, rant and rave, roaring like a lion, seeking someone to devour. But he is an already defeated enemy. His demise is assured. Christ is and always will be the victor. The kingdom of God has come. As I've pondered these passages that have been read for us today, it has become clear, even more clear to me, especially in Acts chapter 1, that Jesus made some wonderful promises to his people, to us in the church of Jesus Christ, the church of the Nazarene. These are our promises to which we can make a certain and undeniable claim. I want to talk about those promises for a few moments. That's, there is, first of all, the, the promise of his presence. There's a context to this promise. Late in his ministry, Jesus had gone to Jerusalem for the Festival of Tabernacles. This was one of the several feasts each year. But the Festival of Tabernacles was actually the most popular, the most celebrative. Jerusalem would have been jammed with the pilgrims coming in to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. The temple grounds would have been absolutely covered with their their booths, their tabernacles that they were building. They were built out of only things that grew from the ground. It was something like the Rose Bowl in the U.S. in Pasadena on January the 1st. It was beautiful. It was celebrative. It was amazing to see. And on the final day of the feast, the seven, eight days they were together, the final day, the great day of the feast, the the priests would 
take pitchers and go to the pool of Siloam and dip their pitchers into the water and take the pitchers filled with water to the temple and pour it out to the ground, the dry, thirsty ground as a symbolism of the fact that the thirst that everyone has for water. Water, you see, is life. That's why we so often find ourselves drilling wells and villages for people because water is life and it symbolizes so much for us. And on that day as they poured the water out and the people looking at the water pouring out on the dry, thirsty ground suddenly heard a voice. <laughs> the voice that said, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, has promised, out of him will flow rivers of living water. And John goes on to say, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, said John, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. He was raised up on the tree. He was raised out of the grave. He raised, ascended into the heavens at the right hand of the Father. He is seated there interceding for us. He and the Father have poured out the Holy Spirit. He has come. During the evening before his betrayal, Jesus said to his disciples, it's good for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He had promised them, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And now, here we are. The resurrected Christ has gathered his disciples for his final instructions to them. He'd spent 40 days following his resurrection, instructing them, assuring them, calming their fears. And in his final words, he reminded them once again of his promises, which they had heard him speak about. And on the day of Pentecost, 10 days later, they were gathered in the upper room. It's reasonable, reasonable to assume that this was probably the same upper room where Jesus had gathered with his disciples on the evening before his betrayal, arrest, and crucifixion. It was in that room that he had promised them that after he had gone away, the Father would give them the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the one who would be with them. They were now in that room when the sound of a violent wind began to blow. Flames came to rest on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. We read it as we've read it for 2,000 years and we've read it so many times we've, we've lost the excitement of what must have happened there. Susan and I have lived in Tornado Alley in the USA for the last 38 years. Uh, we uh, have come to understand violent wind. I grew up a part of my life on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi in the USA where I lived through two hurricanes. I, I understand wind. Wind screams when it begins to blow. It, it can be unsettling and disturbing and they were in that room. And the description we have is that it was a violent wind. And they suddenly saw the flames separating and coming to rest on each of them. And then we were told they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came in that stunning, confusing, unprecedented moment of wind and fire, I'm, I'm confident that many of those who were present were not sure what was happening. But I believe among the first who knew was Mary. In that divine chemistry that we will never fully understand, I believe that Mary suddenly thought, I know who this is. Jesus is here. My boy is back. And in that moment, she knew he had kept his promise. He was there with them, no longer just with them. He's now in them, among them, 
filling the room, filling them in their lives and in their hearts. He had kept his promise. My dear fellow Nazarenes, as a follower of Jesus, whoever you are, wherever you are, you are, whatever your circumstances, you are not alone. He is with you in the midst of your service, in the face of uncertainty, or in the moment of crisis. You are not alone. He is with us wherever we are. And he's made a promise. And as Nazarenes around the world can testify, he has kept his promise. But there's another promise that comes in this passage. It's the promise of his power. Now, we love to talk about power. We, we love to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. We plead with God to give us the power, and appropriately so. But I'm afraid sometimes we're not altogether clear in what we're asking God to do. I'm afraid that sometimes when we think in terms of power, we Christians are tempted to rely on our government's political and military power to legitimize or give the right of the church of Jesus Christ to function or even to exist. My dear friends, there is no other power on earth needed to legitimize or protect the church of Jesus Christ. We live by the power of the Holy Spirit. And whether the conditions are favorable or unfavorable, whatever we are facing, we know that every government, however favored toward the church or opposed to the church, is temporary. When all the governments of men are ended and the final trumpet call is surrounded, the church will be alive and well, living in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is not the power of overwhelming force. This is not the might of military machines or political parties. This is the power to live victoriously. This is the power to love transformingly. This is a different way of being human. We do not live as the world around us lives. We live as participants in the kingdom of God that has come. We're living, breathing, actual representations of the kingdom of God. This is the power of suffering love. This is the power of holy love. This is the love of God shed abroad in our hearts through the sanctifying presence of the Holy Spirit. This is the power to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. This is the power to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Jesus said there's no greater commandment than these. This is the power to love our enemy. And this is the power to love our brother and sister. Oh, how we need this power. How often, even in the church, we descend into backbiting and quarreling in our churches and homes. But Dr. Mildred Bangs Winecoop wrote about this love. She said, uh, this love is, is, is found here. God in Christ tells us what this love is. It is forgiveness. Forgiveness is taking all the hurt given by an enemy, even in the form of our friends, without demanding reparations. The cost is all on the one who offers the forgiveness. It is accepting the one who had delivered the blows or the injustice as if he had never transgressed against us. Reconciliation costs the reconciler more than it costs the one to whom reconciliation is offered. It is, she wrote, an aggressive 
confronting of a situation in which humiliation of the transgressor is made impossible. It lifts the sinner to his feet and treats him like a person worth loving. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power of suffering love. This is the power also to love the lost and broken around us, transparently loving them, reaching them, touching them, embracing them, bringing them into the life and fellowship of the church in order that they might be transformed, not waiting until they're transformed to bring them to us, but bringing them to us in order that he might transform them in their relationship with us through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. The late Mother Teresa wrote in one of her prayers for her co-workers and herself, Dear Jesus, help me to spread your fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with your spirit and life. Penetrate and possess my whole being so utterly that all my life may be a radiance of yours. Stay with me and then I shall begin to shine as you shine. May the power of your Holy Spirit influence all I think and do as the fullness of your love overflows my heart and life. Amen. Sounds like a good Nazarene prayer to me. And this is what Jesus was talking about to his disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And in these promises, there's another the promise of his purity. Not our purity that we create, that we form, that we by our own energies and strength of will can establish. No, this is purity that comes from God. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel wrote, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws and you will be my people and I will be your God. And these wonderful words from the prophet is the promise that our hearts may be made clean, pure. He desires to purify us from a stubborn, resistant, self-oriented heart. He desires that we surrender ourselves completely to the will and purposes of God. He desires to so purify us that we will consistently walk in obedient proactive, willing love and forgiveness. This love, this perfect love may come to so characterize us that it becomes the operating principle of our lives. This purity is made real by the infilling of the Holy Spirit and it enables us to demonstrate in this world in our relationships with one another and with him the fellowship and love that exists between the father and the son and the spirit in the holy trinity we are demonstrations of that relationship when we live as though the kingdom of God has come then we may live in joyous anticipation of that heavenly banquet being prepared for every one of us this is what it means to live out in the present reality that the kingdom of God has come. This is what it means to reflect the holy character of God in the midst of a broken and confused world. When I was a boy of 13, we lived on the Mississippi coast on the shores of the Gulf of Mexico where Dad pastored in Biloxi. During that time, I came to know an old fishing boat captain by the name of Captain Frank Pate. He was a wiry little rugged man who loved to write poetry of all things. And he'd lived on board ships and boats all of his life. Now late in his career, 
after retiring as a captain in the U.S. Navy and as a tugboat captain on the Warrior River, pushing barges up and down the river, he was content to serve as the captain of the Holiday II, a charter fishing boat about 40 feet long harbored in Biloxi. I loved that old boat. On a few occasions, he called me and invited me to serve as a deckhand for a day. I would help the fishermen to manage their rods and reels and bait their hooks and help them bring their catch onto the deck and mop and clean the deck. He taught me how to navigate the boat and often let me man the helm, steering us out to the fishing banks or sometimes back into harbor the entire way. I, I was in heaven. One hot summer day, we had been fishing much of the morning. This was going to be one of those all-day excursions, and so about midday, it was hot. It was a summer day, and the sun reflecting off of that salt water, and you could just taste the salt all the time, and you didn't carry a lot of cold water in those days on the boat, you, and what water you had, you saved it for the coffee. And so we, uh, we were all thirsty. And Captain Pate came over to me and he said, all right, Jess, and gave me a heading and said, you take us over here. Well, uh, there was a string of islands about 12 miles out from Biloxi, and you always steered around those islands, giving them wide berth because the, the, the water was deceptively shallow in many places there. But, but I realized that as he gave me the heading, we were headed right toward the end of one of the islands. And I uh, was a little uneasy, but he said, no, it's okay. I, I know the area. You just follow the heading. And so I did. Now and then he'd come back over there and said, did you see anything yet? Well, no. Finally, he said, just look right straight off the bow. Straight off the bow was something standing up out of the water. And as I watched it begin to take shape and form as it drew nearer, it was a pipe, a metal pipe about six inches around, just standing up out of the Gulf of Mexico, about two miles off the, the shores of one of the islands. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. He said, now, bring her in slow and let her drift right up beside the pipe. And so, showing him my skills as a helmsman, I brought her in slow and we just drifted up to the side and bounced on the pipe. He said, get your coffee cup. And I, uh, I was a little hesitant. I, I knew this salt water out here. I'd been swimming often enough in the salt water and swallowed enough mouthfuls. I knew I didn't want a mouthful of that. He said, oh, you're going to like this. Trust me. Get your cup. I got the cup and walked over. He said, lean over and just fill your cup with that water. I leaned over and just instantly it was flowing so fast it filled the cup. And as I began to bring it back, suddenly... Did you know water smells? I caught the aroma of clear, clean, cold, sweet water. Oh, I drank my fill. I loaded it again. Everybody on the boat was over there by this time, and everything they could think of, they were filling it with this water. It was delicious. We were in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico, a salty, See, there in the midst of all the salt water that surrounded us was the most refreshing water I could ever remember tasting. It, it, it was the only thing remaining from what had been at one time a beautiful island hotel with great, great grounds, but during a hurricane about 15 or 20 years before, the hotel and all of that portion of the island had literally been washed away, and the only thing left was a pipe. But out of the pipe, in the midst of all of the salt around us, was crystal clear, sweet water. I've often thought of that experience in the years since. What a wonderful analogy of what happens. When the power of the Holy Spirit pours out of our lives. Let whoever is thirsty come to me and drink. 
And out of their inmost being will flow rivers of living water. And that living water is not just for us. It is that through us he might refresh the dry, thirsty people all around us who begin to find if I can just get what they have, I will find my thirst satisfied. Oh, the purity is in such contrast to all around us. We don't have to put it on. He pours it in and it flows out as the Holy Spirit is allowed to have complete right of way in our lives. Oh, then we can understand one other thing that sometimes I think we miss in this passage. It's the promise of his mission. And you will be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Oh, Marl read Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. We call it the Great Commission. And, and we often hear it as, now, now you go do this, the command. But in reality, when you get under the language there and out of the various languages we use and into the original languages, you find that it is much less a command than it is an assumption. You're going out there. You are going to be by the very nature of the power and presence and purity of the Holy Spirit drawn into you by your hungering open heart and faith and poured into you by the power of the Holy God who through His suffering Son has made available to us the reality of His life in us. And then out of that flows the ability flows the ability to be his witnesses. This is the natural result of being filled with the Spirit. It is the result of his power at work in us when we really are surrendered to him, when we're walking with him, when we're living in consistent and growing obedience to him, it is natural, it is normal for us to be witnesses, not so much because we pound on their doors as it is that they begin to come to us to ask, what is it about you that enables you to live this life in spite of all that I see around you? It flows out of the character of the Father. It flows out of the mission of the Son. It pours out as one of the benefits of Pentecost. It is not so much a command as it is a promise. You will be my witnesses. That's the church. The living, breathing representation that the kingdom of God has come is here now. That mission. We have three children. You've seen two of them tonight. Uh, John, our oldest son, is five years older than Marlo. And uh, John is six years older than our youngest son, Jim. Oh, we have quite a family. When Jim was five years old, uh, we took a family holiday to Six Flags over Texas in Dallas, Texas, USA, a, a, a large family-themed park for all ages. Uh, it, it's, it's always crowded, but we made one of those blunders. We went on a holiday July the 4th in the U.S. Uh, needless to say, the park was jammed. No, the park was crammed. The park was overcrowded. Thousands of people were there. Tens of thousands of people were there. And we kept wanting to get to a ride, but every ride we came to, the wait was at least an hour, if not longer. And my mother-in-law was with us, so we, we kind of gave out assignments. We said to John, who was 12 years old at the time and about six feet tall, John, you take care of your grandmother. And uh, Susan and I agreed she would take care of Marlo. And I would take care of Jim. Bouncing Jim. Curious Jim. Never still Jim. 
I had an iron grip on his hand. He was always trying to pull away. Because in his mind, you didn't come to the park to stand in line. You came to ride. And he, he just kept pulling away, and I would keep grabbing on. And the crowds were so thick. I mean, we, we couldn't walk spread out. We walked in a tight knot. And there were just people in a tight knot all the way around us. It was just incredible. And I, I remember just being claust feeling claustrophobic. And it was just everywhere. And I, I had an iron grip on that hand. I, I don't know how it happened. I still don't. I just remember very vividly to this very moment what it was like the instant I realized my hand is empty. And Jim is gone. Jim? My voice didn't go anywhere. In the din of the crowd and the press of the people, it was as if I had not said a thing. So I began to press around and push through people, calling Jim's name. Jim, Jim. He was just not there. It was incredible. I, just, I had this sudden sense of loss. I said to Susan, uh, where's Jim? She said, you have him. I was not about to ask my mother-in-law. <laughs> After we'd looked for a while, we, we began to grow frantic and desperate, and we, we eventually called security personnel, and they began to help us look, and they looked, and they had their radios, and they were talking to people all around the park, and, and the same word kept coming back. We, we, we haven't found anyone like that. We showed them pictures. There were families gathered around us now who began to realize what was going on and some of them began to gather in and they were helping us look. We'd show the pictures and, and some of them were weeping with us as we prayed and they were praying for us. It was an incredible time. Three hours. The longest three hours of my life. Do you think there was any moment when I said to Susan, well, you said, we've got John, we've got Marlowe. Two out of three isn't bad. Why don't we just go on home? <laughs> no. <laughs> we were going to find our boy. Whatever it took, we were going to find our boy. And, and your mind begins to race. Is he lost? Is he crying? Is he frightened? Is he hurt? And then that, that question you didn't want to even verbalize, but it kept lingering in the back of your mind as someone taken our boy. Three hours. Three hours. About every 30 minutes, we would send John over to the caboose that was labeled Lost Parents. It's where they put kids and parents together if they were separated somehow and we wanted to stay close to where we were in case Jim did find his way back there and so we were spreading out from time to time my mother-in-law and Susan stayed there and kept Marlowe and John and I were the ones doing everything we could and others were helping us no no help at all but by the time three hours had passed the park was beginning to thin out the sun was beginning to set and it was getting late and my despair was deepening <laughs> I said to John, go one more time over to lost parents. By this time, I was sitting there on the ground, my heart pounding, watching. I could see further. The crowd was thinner, and here came John. And John had an iron grip on a little hand. <laughs> and Jim was skipping along beside him. John says when he got over there, he heard this little voice say, John, there you are. I've been looking all over for you. <laughs> and to our delight, there was our boy. I, I don't know that I've ever hugged one of my children as much. We threw our arms around him. We wept and cried, and Jim was so surprised. Because you see, during the three hours that we were desperately searching for Jim, Jim was riding every ride in the park. <laughs> He'd walk up to the front of the line and say, can I ride with you? And they would say, isn't he cute? He must belong to that family back here. We're going to let him ride with us. And he'd just take off and ride again. Little did we know, 
that that would become a parable for us in our journey with Jim, <laughs> who for 20 years as an adult was deeply in the grip of addiction to drugs and alcohol in and out of jails and prisons and his health wrecked. His capability of living a normal life gone. But three years ago, Jesus found her boy. <laughs> And today, Jim is healed. No medications of any kind. Hepatitis C that had been diagnosed is no longer there. We don't know how, but it's gone. It's completely gone. And Jim has testified to call to preach and is enrolled in the course of study for ministers and preaches every Sunday. He's preaching this morning while we're here. <laughs> Now he testifies to the sanctifying, transforming, healing grace of God every time he gets the chance. As a result of those horrifying experiences in our home and family, I read Luke 15 differently than I had ever read it before. Dr. Luke quoting Jesus, telling the story of a lost sheep and a, a lost coin and two lost boys. I have a new appreciation for what Jesus is telling us about the character of God, about the passion of the Father to find his lost children. Folks, those broken, confused, addicted people around us are God's lost children for whom Jesus died. They are the reasons he came to earth. They are our mission and we must find the lost children of the father and those happy people around us who have no time or room for God and who are riding all of the rides in the park and do not know they're lost we are here for them they are our mission field this is our mission during his ministry, Jesus said to the people around him, he did not come for the righteous. He came for sinners. He didn't come for those who were well. He came for the sick. He did not come for those who were found. He came for the lost. And I have a new understanding of what Jesus was telling his disciples about Pentecost. When the Spirit comes, we will be his witnesses. We will seek his lost children. It is his promise to us and it is possible because he has given to us the power and presence of his Holy Spirit. Therefore, it is our mission to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. The sanctifying spirit pours himself upon us, comes into us like a flood, intending to produce in us a radical Christ-likeness, that is, radical compassion, radical humility, radical forgiveness, radical unselfishness, radical suffering love. And I've seen that love at work in the people of the Church of the Nazarene and around the world. I've seen it in the villages of Bangladesh, where our people have established child development centers, children who have no hope of learning or access to education, have found love, a nourishing meal, or told the wonderful story of Jesus and taught the initial stages of being able to read. Families are being transformed. Whole villages are coming to Christ. A nation is being impacted. And we now have 100,000 Nazarenes in Bangladesh because of this love that you and I are talking about. And in 2010, I joined three others of my colleagues as we participated in the largest ordination class in the history of the Church of the Nazarene when we in one service ordained 193 people. And 30 of them were women, the first women ever ordained a Christian ministry in the nation of Bangladesh. Thanks be to God. 
for what is happening through the power of our love. I saw that love at work in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, where several men from one of our churches carried 50-pound bags of coffee beans for three days over rugged mountain trails in order to get their coffee beans to market in order to have cash. They wanted to get the cash to pay their World Evangelism Fund in full. The pastor brought the cash to the district assembly and presented it to me and Vern Ward, the regional director at the time, because they had heard that there was an economic crisis gripping the church and the world and it was threatening our ability to send missionaries. They were determined that others would hear the life-transforming message of Jesus just as they have heard it. And as I come to the conclusion of my pre-retirement ministry, I do not come in grief or despair. For 51 years, I've served the church to the best of my ability. The last 12 years of this ministry, I've traveled the globe in service to Christ and His church in this office. And I come to this moment with a radical optimism (laughs) that what Jesus Christ has begun in his suffering, death, and resurrection, and in the gift of his Holy Spirit, he is indeed going to carry on to completion until the day of his certain and promised return. He will do it. We recommit ourselves to our mission bringing everybody we can find to the great feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb, because God has kept His promises and we intend to keep ours. He's here with us today in this very room. His very real presence is with us. And as we gather around the table of the Lord, we do so in recognition of His presence and in remembrance of his suffering love, and in preparation for the fulfillment of our mission to make Christ-like disciples in the nations. We celebrate the coming of his kingdom and the anticipation of his glorious, certain coming again. And as we participate in the communion of the Lord's Supper, we rehearse our participation in that great marriage supper of the Lamb. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth these words, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And then wrote Paul, Whenever you eat this bread, And drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're gathered from around the world, followers of Jesus the Nazarene, to express our common bond as his children, redeemed by his blood, cleansed and empowered by his spirit, and responding to his mission in the world. And as is our custom, when we come together in general assembly in this opening service, we gather around the table of the Lord. I want you to hear these words of institution that come from the very familiar passage in the manual of the Church of the Nazarene. The Lord himself ordained this holy sacrament. He commanded his disciples to partake of the bread and wine, emblems of his broken body and shed blood. This is his table. The feast is for his disciples. Let all those 
who have with true repentance forsaken their sins and believed in Christ unto salvation draw near and take these emblems and by faith partake of the life of Jesus Christ to your soul's comfort and joy. Let us remember that this is the memorial of the death and passion of our Lord. It is also a token of his coming again. Let us not forget that we are one at one table with the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty God, we're gathered from around the globe representing over 159 world areas and counting. We're together here only by your grace. In your love and mercy, you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption. He instructed us to partake of these emblems of bread and wine in remembrance of his suffering and his death and in joyous celebration of his glorious resurrection. Hear us, O God, as we receive these expressions of your creation, the bread and the wine. May our hearts rejoice at your mercy and grace. May our lives be transformed by your presence. May our service to you be given with glad hearts and pure hands. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit is worshipped and glorified, one God forever and ever. Amen. As the servers distribute the elements of communion, you'll receive a cup in which you will find both the bread and the wine. When you have the cup in hand, please proceed to first open the bread in the lid of that cup and hold it until everyone has received the elements. In a few moments, we will eat the bread together. Let's eat the bread together. Thanks be to God. Will you now join me as you carefully open the cup? Pull the cup firmly. Peel the top back. You hold in your hand the cup of remembrance and proclamation. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And the apostle Paul said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink the cup in remembrance. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. In a moment, the ushers will begin to pass the trays along to allow you to place your cups back in the trays. My brothers and sisters, God has kept his promises and we will fulfill our mission. Please stand. And now, almighty God, 
unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Go in peace.